Thank you. So like Jason said, um, my name is Lisa Baxter. I'm based down here on our Tifton campus. So it's about three and a half hours south of our main campus up in Athens. Uh, so for reference, we are about an hour north of the Florida line. So pretty far down here. So a lot of, of the pictures and examples you'll see are Bermuda grass based, but everything's fairly general and that it can be applied to any form of pool season forage. Uh, so if you, you have you know, a, a specific question of, you know, how would this fit with fescue or, or summer annual or something like that, uh, please let me know. Uh, so I actually grew up in North Carolina, so in fescue country, uh, about an hour north of Charlotte or so. Uh, from there, I went up to Berea College, uh, just a little bit south of Richmond and Lexington and Kentucky for my undergrad. Uh, then I moved to Athens uh, in Georgia for my master's degree, actually working under Dennis Hancock, uh, working on the Bermuda grass stem maggot. So anything you see coming out of the University of Georgia related to the BSM it stemmed from my research in some way. Uh, from there, went out to West Texas uh, to pursue a PhD in, in forage crop um, at Texas Tech University. I love the research that I was able to do out there, uh, but I tell people all the time that all the country songs were true about what West Texas was like. It's, it's hot and cold and dry and dusty and brown and not, not for me long term. So I'm glad I moved out there and did the research I was able to do and learn from the people that I was able to learn from. But I am very happy to be back in the Southeast working at the University of Georgia. Um, been here, back here for five years now, officially for, for three as a faculty member. Uh, so like you said, we're gonna start talking a little bit about hay storage and baling production. And it looks like there are some follow-up questions uh, kind of stemming from last month's presentation or, or the last presentation. Uh, so I, I do have a few things on if you're struggling with dry down of, of a crop, and, and we see this all throughout the Southeast, especially if you all are in the heat wave that we are right now, it is hot and humid and muggy. And it's really hard to get anything to dry, even if it's not actually raining in that moment. Uh, so a few things that we can do, one that I know we really struggle with producers doing here is, is going in and just scalping a field down to nothing. When we're able to leave a, a nice stubble on that forage, and so for, for Bermuda grass, that's about three inches from fescue, we actually recommend a four inch stubble height. It almost makes a little canopy, like you can, or a little perch that you can see there, that the rest of the grass that you cut just falls down on. So it lets the air move all around that hay crop drying, rather than just laying right there on the wet ground. It does a lot of other things such as promoting regrowth and helping with photosynthesis, following cutting and, and, and your more general things like that. Uh, but the way I've been able to sell a lot of producers on this is, you know, it can help to an extent reduce your drying time just because you don't have that grass sitting right on top of the wet ground. Another thing we can do uh, is look at a mower with a conditioner. Uh, I, it seems to be kind of in pockets throughout the Southeast, whether someone is really interested in, in a conditioner uh, or not. Um, we strongly promote them here in, in South Georgia. And the type of conditioner that we ultimately will go with uh, depends on the major crop that we grow. Uh, so you can see here, there's, there's two types of conditioners. One's the impeller or time type. And then this one's a roller or a crimper. Depending on where you are and what company you're working with, and the names may change a little bit. And yes, we know that small stem grasses, so our Bermuda grass and our fescue, um, rye grass, things like that, are going to work better with this first type, the impeller at the time. Uh, but our big stem grasses, so our sorghum, our sorghum sudans, and, and then our legumes like alfalfa, are going to work better with the roller and crimper type. If any of you have ever priced a mower conditioner, they're not cheap. Uh, and I don't know any producer that has both types of these on their farm. So they pair them with a specific top. So what we tell them to do is to choose the one that matches the most acreage that you are producing and baling on your farm. 
And for most of ours, it's going to be Bermuda grass. So they're going to go with this in Taylor and Kyle type. So it doesn't mean that you can't switch these around and, and use them for the other, the other forages. Uh, we're just not going to see the same level of benefit when we run run them through this. So for instance, when we're bailing or, or mowing a Bermuda or alfalfa mixture, we're running it through an impaler or time type, but we are adjusting it so that we are reducing the, the level of conditioning. So we're not beating the leaves off the alfalfa. So you have some modifications that you can make, um, but we do see that these dramatically reduce your drying time. A question that I get a lot, um, and I believe this was covered last month, so we're not going to you know, read through all of this, um, is, is can that mower conditioner replace the pattern? And it, it can to some extent, but we really see a, a synergistic effect when we use a mower conditioner and a tatter together um, for hay production. So if we are using that tatter, we need to use it correctly. Uh, one of the greatest quotes I think I heard from one, a fellow faculty member here that, that recently retired and moved up to Tennessee, uh, John Bernard, um, was that a, a tether is not a tillage piece of equipment. And so when we set those times, they need to just gently brush the top of the grass um, or the top of the stubble so that we're, again, not reducing that leaf area uh, or, or introducing uh, a, a lot of ash content into that material. Um, Oh, anything. So I see it a lot of it, if it kind of digs down in there and we just want it to gently brush the top. This is another reason to have that nice three to four inch shovel height that you leave behind after mowing um, so that it can just gently right through that shovel and not dig down into the ground. So this can also you know, affect dry down to an extent. Um, we did a, a study just looking at forage quality following a, a rotary rake versus a wheel rake. And we found a lot of it comes down just to how well can you assess that equipment and, and adjust it to the recommendation. Um, but we, we, I, I've done other presentations where I, I go more in depth detailing, you know, which one would you use? But I wanna focus just right here on that drying time. Um, with the rotary rake, the, the way the windrow is made, and I think you can, you can kind of see it there, rotary rakes make taller um, and fluffier windrows, whereas a wheel rake, or you may hear them called speed rakes or V rakes, uh, it twists that forage. And so once we were able with the rotary rake to get it into a windrow earlier, um, you can actually run that rake at a, a in the five to ten percent more moisture than you can a wheel rake, um, but it's also going to dry faster in that windrow because it is fluffier and allows for more airflow. So again, if somebody's really struggling with dry down, this could be a potential way to help that. Uh, just like with the cutter, we've we've got to make sure we're adjusting these properly so that they're just barely touching touching the top of the ground um, and and not really digging down into that soil. And going into the baling part, and this, this will come up later. Uh, if any of you have ever done some sort of hay field day, uh, you know, when we get to the afternoon where we run the fancy equipment that everybody wants to come and see, I, you hear this statement a lot. If I just had that new baler, I could make better bales. Um, I, I help out a lot of, of hay demos um, around the state. And I can tell you, I've seen a lot of beautiful balers make some ugly bales. Uh, and a lot of it comes down to just how they're being operated. Uh, overall, we've got to slow down um, in our ground speed. Uh, the slower we can go, and uh, we'll ultimately increase that bale density because it has more time turning in that baler. Um, and, and newer balers can certainly run faster than older balers, but there, there's a, a window that's just kind of an optimum. Um, and a lot of it depends on how thick your, your stand is that you, or your windrow is, uh, how good of an operator are you, especially in that field, how well do you know the field. Uh, and, and for us, it's how many holes are in the field. And I know that's the case for a lot of the southeast. Um, we also want to watch our PTO speed. Generally, the tractor seems to be moving fast and the PTO is not where we, it's recommended for that particular baler. So we, if somebody's saying my baler's just making terrible bales, 
the odds are they need to slow the speed, the tractor speed, and bump up that PTO speed to that 540 that's typically recommended for Baylor. So leading into our storage part of it, um, this is, you know, it's proportioned for a six foot bail. You can, you know, scale it down accordingly. Uh, if you think about when you're looking at the face of a, of a round bale, in that outer four inches, which is you know, a little bigger than the width of my hand, the prop, you know, the average width of the hand, uh, that's 25% of a bale's weight in that outer four inches. Um, in the outer six inches, we're looking at 33%. The outer foot, um, we've got half the bale weight. So even though we're talking, we're talking about a six foot diameter bale, and that outer 12 inch ring around the bail is half of our bail's weight. Um, 75 percent in the outer 18 inches. So this right there in the middle of that bail is 25 percent. Um, I don't know about you all, but I mean, and I love bail and hay, don't get me wrong. Um, you're gonna see a lot of posts about it next week for national forage and coming from me. Um, but haymaking is a lot of work to only get 25% of your effort by the time you get to feeding. And so storage plays a good part of that. Um, it, any state that I've driven through, through the Southeast, you, you, you always, and outside of the Southeast for that matter, it never fails. You always see that long row of hay that's been stored up near a fence line near a road for far too long. It's kind of black and crusted over. Um, there's probably some, some mold, it's kind of soggy on the bottom. Um, Think about when we go and spear that bell uh, to go feed it and you lift it up. Odds are that the bottom part of that bell, the size, depending on how long it's been stored, it's just going to fall off, especially if it's some sort of twine wrap bell. Um, so, and, and most of the top, the animal's probably going to pick around. So, it's not hard to get down to 25% you know, usable material in a bale if you think about it, especially in the hot and humid Southeast. So this work was actually done up in Wisconsin, but the same principle applies here. So they used a, a grass legging mixture. We do the same on any any perennial or annual grass um, or forage for that matter. But they looked at how did the moisture content change within a bale during storage for a twine wrap bale versus a bale that was elevated. And they're taped on a pallet, um, but it, it would work the same whether we put it on gravel or anything like or old tires anything to just get that bale up off the ground. And so you can see here the it's kind of counterintuitive, but red is really good. That's the driest part of the bale. The more we drift down into the greens, the blues, and ultimately the purple, the more moisture that's in that bale, which translates to a lot of dry matter and quality losses. Uh, so we look, especially there on the bottom of the bale, because remember this is looking at you know, ground level versus um, or, or on the ground versus if it's elevated. And these are both fine wrap bales. Um, you can see that when we put that fine wrap bale directly on the ground, we've got a lot of moisture wicking up into that bale. Whereas if we just stored it on a pallet or something so that moisture was able to kind of stay below that bale surface um, and it was able to breathe a little better, then we were a better able to protect that. Um, we still see the weathering on the side, which is to be expected with a pine wrap veil, um, but we're protecting ultimately more of that outer ring that we really need, that, that's holding a lot of our bale weight. Um, so this is affecting about 25% of our bale here. So same concept, but when we looked at the pine wrap versus a, a net wrap veil, you, you, know, you see a, a, a big area being affected here, so 50 to 75% of the bale. This is because when moisture hits a fine wrap or excuse me, uh, a net wrap bale, it's going to come down and it should roll off the side rather than seeping into the bale like it would with with fine. Um, if it's stored directly on the ground, you still have that potential for moisture to come in, uh, not to the same extent as the fine wrap bale because there is a plastic layer there, but we are still going to see some loss on the bottom. Uh, of that bale. So this question comes up at any forage talk I, I seem to give related to, to hay feeding, et cetera. And it's, you know, can I afford that hay barn? Um, or we'll word it a little differently if we're posing the question of, did you already pay for a hay barn 
um, just by feeding hay that's been stored outside versus inside. So this, this figure could be a little hard to read. It was actually first created by one of our ag engineers here uh, at the University of Georgia. And we'll start down here at the bottom. You can see the hay value um, that we have in storage. For this example, I think we do $100 a ton because so that's pretty average. Um, but as you all know, the, the further we get into this season, the price of hay is going up and up. So that line is going to keep moving more towards the right side of your screen. On our y-axis here, you see the break-even barn cost. So that's ultimately how much of a how much of a barn we can we can afford. And then those lines that you see shooting across the screen are our different loss percentages. Um, outside storage loss of 20 to 25 percent is not uncommon, uh, especially if it's you know, been stored outside for a few months. We've watched it had a hurricane or a tropical depression or two. Uh, it, it, these are not unattainable losses. They're actually, they look big, but they're actually fairly common. So if we assume that our hay is valued at $100 a ton of dry matter, um, if we assume we've got 20% outside storage losses, again, it's fairly conservative. This means if we draw that line over, we can afford a barn of $12, $13 per square foot there. Um, I know building costs are high right now, so that $12 to $13 doesn't get you as far as when I first made this slide a couple of years ago. Um, but that's a, that's a pretty nice barn that you are essentially paying for just with those storage losses. So by losing that 20% uh, to weathering from outdoor storage, you're either having to great or plant more forage to graze or increase your acreage to graze. You're having to buy more hay. You're having to buy supplement. That 20% has to come from somewhere. Uh, so you're ultimately paying for a barn that you never built. Um, it's just, it, it's how is that money being spent out? Are you spending it out annually with supplement or are we putting an upfront cost through building a barn to protect the hay that's stored under it for supplement down the road? Um, so it's just two different ways to look at that. So if the hay has to be outside, there are some things that we can do to help further minimize our storage losses. In a, a perfect world, we would always store our bales in a north-south orientation. Uh, I know in the field that I use for the, the bulk of the production and that or the my research that ultimately goes into production for our beef herd here. Um, if I stored north and south, we would have to pull the, the trailers in through the hay field um, and mess everything that I've worked for up um, just because of the orientation of the hay field. So they tend to be east-west. But if we're assuming we're in a big open area, we have a choice for where to put them, we're going to put them north-south. And that's because throughout the day then, this, as the sun moves over those bales, you get a full day of drying in that east-to-west orientation. Whereas if we put them east-west, it's just drying the top of that bale there. We'd also prefer not to store under trees. Um, and it's nothing, you know, that the trees are necessarily causing the problem, but they do tend to trap a lot of humidity. Um, so up near a building, anywhere we're not getting good airflow is going to further contribute to deterioration, mold, so on and so forth. Um, we talked about the, the bale or the mail making process just briefly because it comes up here is we got to make good dense bales. Um, a good dense bale that, that's stored in a, in a nice tight row like this, um, you know, it's not going to be equivalent to barn storage, but it's going to dramatically reduce the, the potential weathering um, just because that moisture can come down and roll off the sides of those bales. And I think I've got some pictures later, of some not so dense bales. Um, but when we have bales of all different shapes and sizes and we're trying to put them in a row, they're, they're not gonna line up right. We're gonna have gaps where the moisture can go down in between the bales. Um, and we're gonna start seeing a lot of storage losses. So that 20% starts looking more and more realistic uh, of losses. And again, any way we can elevate those bales. So I've got a picture of gravel here, um, pallets, tires, uh, you know, a cement pack, something to just get those bales off of a continually wet soil surface. 
uh, and will help reduce those dry, those dry matter losses during storage. So that leads us into the next part of the presentation uh, is where does baleage fit into this? And you, you may hear it called baleage, baled silage. We'll talk about some of the other words in just a second. It can have a lot of advantages. Um, we see that we have min we minimize our harvest losses because and our quality losses because we're able to or to get that material um, baled and wrapped more quickly. So we're baling and wrapping at a higher moisture percent, which helps reduce leaf loss uh, and, and those quality losses. It also gives us more time, or it's much more likely we can go 24 hours without a rain rather than four days without a rain. Um, so it gives us a lot of flexibility, but just like everything else in agriculture, it comes at a cost. Um, it, there is a significant cost associated with the cost of materials, even if you're borrowing the wrapper, that plastic's not cheap. It adds another labor step to it. Um, so when you get done, you know, bailing hay, you know, you, you can go home for the night if you need to. Uh, with baleage, you're not done then. It's got to get in the wrap. Um, so we do need that, that next step. Um, there's also a great potential for what we call operator error. Um, so we're going to talk through some ways that we can help minimize that, um, especially if somebody is just trying baleage from the very beginning. So you hear these words oh, thrown around a, a lot. Um, and I'll have, have people that I know they know the difference in them and they'll still call me and I'm, I'm trying to pinpoint exactly what they're talking about. So we're talking about, you know, hey, it's pretty straightforward. We're, you're under 15, 18, 20% moisture, you know, how you're classifying it in some sort of square, square around bale. Um, our next step up is the baleage, um, or you may hear it called baled silage. Uh, there we're in the 40 to 60% moisture uh, range. And it's typically in a round bale, but I have seen some squared bales in silage. I don't quite know how they do it, but it, it could be done. Um, baleage and haylage are used interchangeably, but those words actually do mean different things. So they both are in that 40 to 60% moisture range, but the storage method is different. So haylage is typically stored in a bunk silo or bag, very similar to what silage would be but it's at a lower moisture than you see there for the silage. Um, so it may also be called low moisture silage. So it seems, you know, you know some harping here on the vocabulary lesson, uh, but these words do mean different things, especially if we're trying to help someone troubleshoot what could potentially be going on. Um, so when the biggest problem that we see with the bailage is that we're bailing and storing at the wrong moisture. And that ultimately can, can lead to yield loss or storage problems and, and things like mold um, that can show up. So you'll notice some, some trends as we go through, I think it's 10 steps for the less problems with baleage or something like that. I always forget how many steps I put in the presentation. Um, with baleage, an ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of cure. Uh, we we got to know what forage we're working with. Um, we've got to make sure we're at the top of moisture content. Get it either if we're talking about haylage or silage filled, um, baleage or hay bale um, as rapidly and get it wrapped as quickly as possible. Uh, and the key for anything baleage or silage um, in general is, is you've got to keep, we got to get it anaerobic as quickly as possible and we have to keep it there. So, you know, in the Southeast, we we do see that a lot of our species don't ferment very well on their own. We, they were, we're, we're fighting an uphill battle. Um, so, and there's two reasons for that. One is they do have a lower um, concentration of the water-soluble carbohydrate, so WSD, compared to something like corn silage that ferments very, very well. So sorghum would be kind of the next step down from, from corn. Then we have our small grains, something like alfalfa. And Bermuda grass would be down here. Best you would probably be a little higher than Bermuda grass, but not as high as alfalfa. Um, so you can see we're already starting at a disadvantage because our the forages that we're trying to ensile don't have a lot of, of soluble carbohydrates in just naturally. They they don't have a, they were not bred to have a lot of those. Um, 
we also see that the buffering capacity is a lot higher. Um, so much like a full buffering capacity, this is um, we measure is a measure of the ability to change the pH when it is in style. Again, corn silage is our, our gold standard. You see it has a really low buffering capacity there, um, where it's something like the alfalfa, clover, the wheat or grass would be right there with those. It has a very high buffering capacity. Um, and so it doesn't mean that you can't install these forages. It just means that we have a lot working against us, so we have to do everything right from the beginning. Um, so we have that low water soluble carbohydrate and a high buffering capacity. And so it's going to make it more difficult. Um, so as you start looking at failing in particular, we can't lose sight of all the things that make good hay or good grazing. So just like we talked about cutting and grazing on time for, for grazing or, or hay production, um, keeping the uh, the growth stage, you know, and, and remembering that a, a double hike for running that mower across, all these things that we normally talk about that affect forage quality affect the baleage as well. Um, it's often thought that if we just put it in plastic, it magically gets better. Something magic happens during that filing process. When it goes in the bale, that's as high of quality as it's ever going to be. So if we have terrible forage going in, we're going to have terrible forage coming out. So we've got to start with the highest quality crop possible. So the way that we really encourage people to start, and, and this is probably the biggest mistake that we see new producers make, is cutting too much to, or, or that, that first time out of the gate. If they're used to cutting 50 plus acres in a day for hay production, they need to cut that at least in half, if not more, for their first day of, of baleage production. Um, we, we have to think about what our wrapping capacity is with the plastic and work our way back from there. So we cannot cut down more than we can bale and wrap in the next 24 hours. Um, and so if Wrapping is always going to be our rate limiting step. Mowing is very, very fast compared to a lot of the other steps here. Um, so we, we don't want to jump the gun and, and just cut down the entire farm, um, expecting to, to put it into bagels because it's not, it, we're not going to be able to move that fast um, with the typical equipment that a producer will, will have on hand. So again, wrapping is that like rate limiting step. So we got to think backwards. So if our bales, they need to be wrapped in that plastic um, within 12 hours max, earlier the better, um, to prevent the baling or the baling from uh, heating up um, because that leads to dry matter and quality losses. Before we bale, we need to get to at least 60% moisture. Um, so to give you some reference, normally when we go out and cut fresh forage, we're, we're at about 80 to 85 percent moisture at that moment. So we've got to drop about 20 percent. Um, if the, it's, the hotter it gets, the windier it gets, and to an extent, the humidity can play a role. So the lower humidity, better drying conditions, um, and then any mechanical conditioning we can do will all help reduce that drying time. Um, I think there's some papers out there that kind of document this dry down, but there's a lot of factors coming into play. And so each time is going to be a little different. Um, so for for reference, we tend to cut in the afternoon here in South Georgia. Um, so that way your your carbohydrates in the plant are, are and the sugars in the plant are the highest. And so we'll we'll cut in the evening, um, start around six o'clock or so and get that cut. If we're talking about winter annuals, but we'll start earlier. Um and then we come in the next morning at you know, seven, eight o'clock, and we do a moisture test to see where we're at. There are some times we're in the field bailing by 9 a.m. There are other times that it's two o'clock and we're still looking at our watch, wondering if we're gonna get home before dark that day. Um, so it can be all over the place. We just gotta keep an eye on it. We'll talk about moisture testing here in a little bit. So just like with the storage, we got to break and bail the right range of moisture. So here's the range that we're normally working in. Um, it will wilt, you know, pretty quickly right out of the baler or right out of the mower. And a lot of people just want to jump the gun. They're like, I've got to get in there and, and get that bailed. And, and they'll nearly run the baler behind the mower. Um, 
one, that adds a lot of extra weight to the piece of equipment that you're working with. Um, but two, we do have a lot of toxicity potential, such as the cross-radiated uh, problems and uh, listeriosis that comes from bailing at too high of a moisture. So that 40 to 60 percent range is where we would like to be for bailing production. Below 40 percent, it doesn't mean that you can't wrap it, but we're not going to see good fermentation. So it's just going to stay kind of steady state um, in, in that bail. Um, so we're not getting the benefit of the ensiling, um, but we also don't get the you know ease of just storing the dry hay. Um, as we start kind of drifting down to that 30% mark, that's when we start getting to the fire risk um, if it's you know, stored and not and not wrapped. Um, and then below that 10% sort of the ideal case. Uh, so looking at it specifically for baleage, here's more of where we would start thinking. Once we we're at that, you know, we get to 70 pretty quickly. Um, most likely when you come and do that moisture, that first moisture test the next day, you're going to be at 70 to 65%. That's the time to get your equipment ready, not when that moisture is at the point you need to start raking and baling. You've got to get it ready earlier. So that means go ahead and get your rake hooked up, get your baler hooked up if you can. Have everything ready to go so that when you do that next moisture test and it comes back, you know, closer to 60% uh, and then ultimately right below 60%, then we can go in and start raking and baling. Um, the baler can nearly follow the rake in many cases. It depends on what equipment the producer has available. So ideally, um, we would be raking and follow with that baler not very far behind. If you do have to rake everything and then go back and bale, you likely need to reduce the area that you're going to be baling at any one time just to ensure that you can, can make it um, to get it into that bale before it hits 40% moisture. At that 40% mark, if we if we come out and it's it's already you know 40, 42% or so, we're done with baleage production. You know, we may get a dew on it and it kind of artificially increases that moisture, but the, the plant itself is dry at that drier at that point, it's not going to install well. So at this point, we stop and we start thinking about heavy production um, and, and drying it down for hay. So when it comes to determining moisture, we've got a few options. Um, I always have people ask about these hay moisture testers and probes. There's two options here. This is the in bale, and this is the windrow one. Um, the windrow one can work for baling uh, or hay. The problem that I really have with it is it, it, it's highly variable by person. So I could come in and press it down. We, we take the forage up out of the window, put it in a five gallon bucket and press that, the satellite dish one here down on top of it. And I could get one reading. Somebody could come up behind me on the same sample in the same bucket in the same meter, push it down and get a different reading. Just because they're pushing it down differently, at a different pressure, a different angle. And I'm not really comfortable with, with basing my bailing decisions on something that can, can jump five to six percent with, you know, just like, Quite change. Um, the problem with the, these in bale moisture testers, again, it depends on the, the density and, and how well that, that forage is pressuring up against these um, diodes up here. Um, but these are not calibrated above or to work above, I think it's 30% from any of them that I've seen. I'm sure somebody will eventually come out with one if they haven't already for, moi or for the moisture range of baleage. But most of these that we have floating around are only for moistures above or below 30%. I have a lot of people tell me that they can determine moisture by feel and because they've calibrated themselves over time. And, and I usually look at it and say, good for you. I can't do it. Um, again, there's a lot that can go wrong, and this is a lot of work. And so I, I, I want to be sure that we've got the tools that we need or the, the accurate moisture we need these tools. Um, rather than just twisting it to see the moisture. We heavily recommend the microwave moisture test um, here, and I think all states have a video or a handout on how to do that, but if you need a, a, or if you need a source on that, please let me know. Um, the best option would be one of these posture testers. Um, it's highly accurate. Um, it achieves pretty much the same thing as the microwave moisture test. Um, but it, it can be more accurate. You see these use a lot in dairy production or silage production. Um, these, however, cost about $400. 
whereas a microwave from Walmart is about this box, or we have an old one lying over here. So that's, uh, we, that's why we tend to stick here with oxygen. So we do get questions about the different inoculants, and I don't want to go too deep into these because that I definitely don't consider myself an expert. Um, but what these are allowing us to do is to add a specific type of bacteria um, into the, the baleage, so it helps dominate the fermentation process. So when you, if you ever hear about baleage that kind of has an off odor or it smells bad, that means it's got the wrong type of bacteria that's dominating during that fermentation process. So to help kind of steer the odds in our favor, we put more of what we want in there and to achieve the, the desirable result. So there's three different kinds. There's the, the homolactic that produces the lactic acid, heterolactic does lactic and acetic acid. Um, some previous research at UGA recommended a combination product that contains both of these species in there. So with these, we want to think of them almost like an insurance policy. So I tend to see both these and hay preserves as used as kind of a way to cut corners, but these these don't fix bad or lax management. These are if we, you know, we 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 did everything right, we grew the best boards we could, but it just it, we're we're not sure that it has the, the, the right sugar or the or as much any sugar you know, as we wanted. Or we're just not sure if, if it was, you know, you know, everything's just right. Um, so this is that little bit of interest to just help us, you know, be correct when we're not quite sure. So it doesn't mean that we can, you know, put it on grass that's been growing six to eight weeks and make it have the quality of grass that's been growing only four weeks. Um, it, it, it can't fix things like that. It's just that little bit of, of kind of a, a safe or a security. Uh, when you're, you're, you're not quite sure. So the way they work, um, the homolactic helps improve the fermentation and the word silage is on here a lot, but it, it applies to baleage as well. Um, and the way it does that is it helps drop that pH quicker. The quicker we can drop that pH, the more um, dry matter we're able to maintain unless we lose through things like carbon dioxide. Um, the heterolactic bacteria helps extend um, stability in the bunk. Um, when we're talking about silage or haylage, um, it would also help in the case of baleage if we're feeding an inline from keeping the face of, of the bale from ever feeding out more stable. Um, and so it, what these do is suppress yeast and mold to help extend that life. The combination product should provide the best of both. It does come at a cost though. Um, so there's a, you know, a few reasons why you would go kind of back and forth um, again, we're going to recommend that combo product um, based on previous research. But if you think about what we deal with in the Southeast, um, a lot of our baleage is winter annual versus summer annual. Um, we, we do tend to have high temperatures. Um, and we at, up until the day, we have pretty drought stress down here in Houston. So um, those tend to work better for us. But you can weigh the, the pros and cons of each of those for, for your particular um, situations to deal with. So the effectiveness of these also can depend on the operator, and, and you don't have to read all of those, but what it gets at is you need to read the product label and make sure that you're storing it correctly and applying it correctly. A big one that, that catches a lot of people is you can't use chlorinated water, so we do have to find um, well water or bottled water, so, something that's not been, been chlorinated. Um, we also don't want to put it out at too high of a pressure because these are living products uh, and, and they can be killed. Uh, there's a lot of different types of applicators. These are some that were, were, were shared with me. Um, you can see this. Oops, here we go. Um, this looks like more of a liquid applicator. That these two are, are dry. You can mount them on the baler or the tractor. Um, but ultimately, they all have some sort of tube where you can see them or not running right down so that the material comes out right in front of the baler pickup. So ideally, we're not going to have somebody driving on an ATV in front of the baler trying to put these out. It needs to come out as close to when that baler or that material goes into the baler pickup as possible to be as effective as it can. So we've already talked about this a little bit, but bale uniformity goes a long way. And you'll see that when we start talking about the in-mine uh, bales. 
We want good square edges on those bales as dense as possible. Knives can possibly help with that. And we see a good benefit of them. You know, in Baylor, there's some work that's been done in the Midwest. We really need better work done on that in the Southeast. Um, but it, it makes sense because with the knives, we can usually get a denser bale um, so that it keeps more oxygen out of the bale to begin with, which means we enter an anaerobic state earlier. So it, it's very logical. Um, so two questions that need to come up fairly early in the conversation about it, you know, can I pursue or, or look at baleage on my farm is can the baler support baleage bales? So these bales weigh a lot more than a typical hay bale will. Um, and so there, there's a lot of, of silage balers out there now, um, or the catches that you can add on that uh, when purchasing a baler that kind of helps break the inside and keep it clean, but they're also built heavier so that they can withstand the added weight from that moisture of harvesting a, or baling a higher moisture product. So it's a very important question to ask early on. Um, the, a lot of older bailers just can't support them. And so when you go bouncing through the field, uh, it's only a matter of time before something in that bailer gives out and breaks. Another critical question, uh, because a lot of small producers, you know, they, they only have tractors up to a certain size, is can the tractor safely lift a bailer's bail? So most hay bales we're talking, they're in that you know, the 800, that 7, 800 to 1,000 pound range, depending on the size. Baleage bales are, are more of 12, 13, 1,400 plus, depending on how, how big they are and how much moisture is in there. Uh, so if somebody comes in, you know, a little 40, 50 horsepower tractor, it may not be able to safely move those bales around. So it's something to consider as well. So these are some things that we need to avoid. You know, we should be avoiding with hay, but even more with baling. Um, so we, you know, we, we don't want to be kind of flared out in. It makes it really hard when we're looking at an inline hair like this. Um, it just puts a lot of unnecessary stress on that plastic. Um, we want to avoid odd shapes like this that have a lot of openings. So this is one of our old student workers. Uh, Jacob was a big guy. He was like six four, a lot bigger than me. Um, and he didn't take a lot of effort to get his arm in that bail. That that bail there is never going to make good bail. Um, it's going to put a lot of stress on the plastic. It's likely going to rip. Um, it, it, it's going to be extremely problematic to go down the road. Um, so anything we can do to avoid these situations, the better. Um, we already talked about this, so we'll skip over that. Um, we talked about this briefly, but we, I mean, we do see an effect of bell density on that fermentation. So this was some work, again, done up north, but you see the two different moistures there, so the, the, the higher moisture and the denser bale um, did reduce that pH more, has more lactic acid that you like, and we want some acetic acid, but we don't want it to dominate the fermentation. Um, we keep kept the temperature down and, and recovered more of that dry matter. So the next one here is choosing the right wrapper. And there are, are a lot of things to consider before someone purchases a wrapper. Um, we want to you know, think about how much do we want to spend? How much labor do we have? How, how many bales are we going to actually going to wrap each year? So a lot of things to consider. Um, something like this little individual wrapper here, yeah, and these prices were about a year and a half ago, the last time I quoted all these. So the prices probably went up now because of supply chain issues. Um, but you know, here we're in the 20,000 range, here we're 20 to 40, and then we'll, we'll get to this one in a minute. You can see a dramatic difference in the bells per hour that you're able to, to put out with an individual versus an inline wrapper here. The big difference that I see, you know, that that will push a lot of people back towards these individual bale wrappers is we're used to, you know, feeding a bale or two of hay. And we may not feed a bale for a while if, if our grass starts growing um, or we move cattle to a new field or whatever it may be. Um, where, so with this, we have that flexibility that if we just want to feed you know, a bell to hold us through a week, a rough weekend, we can do that. Whereas with the inline, or the inline, or the tube line bells in here in the if once we come in and cut that plastic, 
we got to keep feeding those bells at a rate of one to two bells a day um, till we get to the very one. So when you open that tube, you got to be prepared to keep feeding those valves. And a lot of our cow calf producers in the southeast aren't prepared to feed out that volume of bales, especially continuously throughout the season. Um, and so that that will, even though these are probably more economical <coughs> in terms of how many bales you can you can do it, as it's definitely more um, respectful of the time. Just that flexibility in feeding is going to push a lot of people back here. Now. We're starting to see more of, of the integrated ones come onto the market. Uh, the chrome one that you see there is probably one that I see the most um, at, at field days and, and around. Um, it makes the bale up here, dumps it out onto a turntable, and then immediately wraps it and drops it down. Um, so you can be working on your next bale while it's back here wrapping and it drops it back. Um, so you're doing both jobs at the same time. That comes at a cost that we gotta be prepared for. Um, we don't really know the output rate for these. We don't have a general rule for them yet. Uh, the big downside that we do see here is that then you need some sort of grabber to be able to move those bales. We can't steer them just with a typical hay steer. So that's an additional cost that we have to consider. I get a lot of questions about, you know, what, what should I charge if we custom hire? And we last time we figured these out prices out, it was in 2020. Prices change so often now that I cannot keep this updated. So this has likely gone up at least 50%. Um, I'm off, you know, when somebody asks me, you know, hey, how much should I charge for something? I am not the person to tell them. Uh, I don't know what they have in that equipment, what their, their labor rate is, and so on. So there's, there's a lot of things to consider. They need it. Um, have some sort of depreciation and on their wrapper. You got to consider the plastic that's being used, the fuel and the repairs um, for the wrapper and the equipment. Uh, and then also figuring a labor charge. So, you know, pretty conservatively, we're looking at $120 per ton of dry matter. And again, with the cost of all of these materials going up, those have likely increased. We want to make sure that we're putting enough plastic on, but no more. So when we're looking at the, the end line, we're using it at six layers. This one is, or excuse me, eight layers, and the individuals are at six layers um, all around. Uh, we ideally would store these on the flat side, so kind of opposite of what it's sitting right here, so that we it actually overlaps more on those sides to further prevent losses. Um, if we're expecting to store these longer than a few months some people will, will increase that that plastic wrap uh, but do keep in mind the more plastic we put on there that like cost of production steadily increases. when we look at where we ultimately wrap that uh, baleage we need to make sure that we're storing it near where we're going to be feeding it out we also want um, to avoid things like tree fence lines and, and, and controlling any ground vegetation that may be around, it doesn't take much for to pop that plastic. So we want to make sure that birds aren't jumping back and forth of the squirrels from the fence line to baling and back. Uh, we don't want weeds, especially broadleaf weeds, that can eventually poke into that plastic on the ground. Um, so all big things that tend to get overlooked um, that can ruin an otherwise really nice set of bales. When we do go to feed them out, we need to make sure we're feeding them appropriately. So we want to make sure that we're matching our quality to our animals' needs. And Bailey's is a great option for those that, that have a lot of nutritional demands, like our growing animals, or young animals, or lactating animals. When we are feeding it, we want to be strategic. Um, we want to use some sort of feeder that's kind of keeping that baleage off the ground and helping to minimize the waste. Uh, we also want to make sure that we're not feeding more than the animals can consume in a day or two, because when we open that plastic and drop that bale, the pH steadily increases. The reason that that bale is stable is because we kept that, that pH down. And so as that pH starts to increase, it's increasing oxygen, that's when we get the foliage and it just sits there and rot. 
So ideally we want to feed within nine months. Um, we've done some work here in Tipton where we've held the bales up to two years, uh, up to two years. It doesn't, it does not hold for two years, y'all. Um, the, the problem is not the quality of the bale, it's the integrity of the plastic. So we, if we could keep that plastic in the past, that baleage would you know, be stable indefinitely. Um, but the, the problem in the Southeast is we can't go more than nine months without some sort of severe storm um, or some sort of wildlife or, or something ultimately trying to attack those bales. Um, and so we, we've got to be considerate of that uh, and feed these out in time and manner. I will have people want to start feeding them out pretty quickly, especially if we get a, a crunch for forage. We really need to wait at least six, preferably eight weeks to start after wrapping to start feeding, just to be sure that you are through all those fermentation uh, processes. Um, you can feed them earlier if you really have to, uh, but if that fermentation is not complete, it may have kind of an off smell and taste, and the animal is going to kind of pick around or they're not they're not going to want to eat it, uh, and they're going to refuse it. Uh, the last one here is to have a plan to handle that plastic. Um, recycling is not currently an option for us in Georgia, and I don't I don't know that it is anywhere in the southeast. Um, we shouldn't burn that plastic, um, but we we've, we've got to find a way to dispose of that. A lot of times we'll we'll fail it, bundle it something in some way. So I'm not recommending running it through a square baler like you like we have seen videos on YouTube and Facebook. Um, but we, we've got to find a way to kind of reduce that bulk just to make it easier to handle. Um, I would love to see recycling options come to the Southeast, uh, but we, we haven't been successful in it so far. I do want to point you, um, if you have somebody interested in Baylid, uh, this is an older publication, but it, it still has a lot of merit to it. Um, this was uh, done by uh, Pruitt at, at LSU and, and Kurt Lacey when he was at the University of Georgia. Um, and they found that baleage technology can be beneficial. Uh, at that time, the break-even size for the herd was about 100 cows to justify owning the equipment. Uh, I would imagine, you know, the cost of feed has gone up, so it makes it more lucrative that way. But as the cost of equipment, fuel, plastic, et cetera, have also gone up, uh, that 100 cow mark likely has been increased as well. Um, so it's not something that your guy with 25 cows needs to, to get into. Um, they need to look at having somebody custom harvest for them. Um, the combination of reducing our feeding and storage losses is not enough to make it economically feasible. We've got to have some sort of high quality forage to be able to, to really justify this. So it's not saying that we can't ensile Bermuda grass and help SU and, and those others. It just means that we're not going to buy equipment specifically for it. So we're going to buy the equipment for our sorghum baling or our ryegrass baling or, or our alfalfa baling. Um, and then if we want to make Bermuda grass or fescue baling or something, we have the equipment on hand already. So keep that in mind. Um, I would encourage you, um, if you do have hay producers in your area or baling producers, we also accept baling samples, um, to have them submit those to the 2022 Southeastern Hay Contest. Uh, we only ever have three to five entries in the entire state of Tennessee, and I would love to see more entries coming in. Um, so if you just Google Southeast Hay Contest, it, it'll pop right up. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email, and I can put you in the contact with your state representative on there. Um, but we'd love to see more Tennessee samples you know, entered into the contest this year. Um, if you haven't seen it, um, Kubota did a really nice forage forum featuring some, some of the researchers and some professors down here in Tipton last August. Um, so if you want some really quick hay and forage resources, um, you can just search Kubota forage forum. They put them all on a really nice website. Uh, it has <coughs> our individual videos that we made uh, and interviewed in the field. And then we have a round table with all of us um, answering kind of hot topic questions that they can came up with and people were, were introducing live during the program. Um, so that, that's one of, uh, is a fantastic resource for somebody who's just kind of curious about hay production or baleage production or just forages in general. Um, I, I, I share that just as much as I do a lot of my extension videos. 
Um, so we do have videos on a lot of, of this, especially the microwave moisture test, if you have questions about that. Um, on our Georgia Forge's YouTube channel, it's pretty easy to find. Um, but again, I can link that to you all if, if needed.